I'm sure you've heard of John 3.16 before. Even if you consider yourself a non-Christian, I'm sure images of people holding up a big, big billboard sign at a sporting event that reads John 3.16 across it uh, come, to, come to your mind. But what exactly does John 3.16 mean? What does it entail? What's the context around this oh-so-famous verse? Well, today, as we continue our Lenten series, in the shadow of the cross, our pastor Justin LaRosa is going to take that story surrounding John 3.16 and unpack it and detail it for us and also offer us some practical advice on how we can live it out and even begin our faith journey. And I also hear that he's going to have a very special friend during the sermon to help illustrate his point. I hope you like it. Check it out. Anybody been watching The Chosen TV series? I've been touched by it. I highly recommend it. It's this multi-season show about the life of Jesus. And today's scripture is actually depicted in the first season during episode six. It's pretty powerful. And if you don't wanna watch the whole thing, there's a short clip on YouTube about it. Now, you know, I was thinking about it. I imagine whether people are religious or not, most are kind of familiar with the passage of scripture that was read today because it includes John 3.16. And we see John 3.16 on signs at major sporting events, on, under T, Tim Tebow's uh, eyes during the 2009 National Championship. We see it down in Ybor City or at the courthouse when people are yelling about it because people seem to crystallize Christianity in this one verse. And so here it is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Yet our reading today kind of begins in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. So I thought it might be helpful to capture some of the context to better understand, number one, what was Jesus talking about? Number two, how we, you and me, us, can be born from above. So Nicodemus, who's this character? This character is a Pharisee, member of the high council called the Sanhedrin. This meant he was not only a leader in the religious community, but he was powerful and influential. And he observed like strict adherence to the law of Moses, like 674 laws, because they believed if they adhered to these laws, that the Messiah would come. So he was following all these things. And then meeting with Jesus would have been really risky during the daytime. He had a lot to lose, which is why the scripture explicitly states that they met in the cover of the night. You see, Nicodemus was afraid of what he could lose by being associated or connected to Jesus. And not only that, throughout John's gospel and in his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, darkness is a prevalent theme. It signifies blindness and lack of understanding, which we see right here with Nicodemus, but it also can signify the old covenant between God and Israel, unbelief, sin, or even evil. Light, on the other hand, represents Jesus Christ, God's love, the source of all life and illuminated understanding. So here's this Nicodemus character, right? He's profoundly curious and drawn to Jesus's miracles, healing, works, and teachings. He was seeking clarification of who this Jesus was. And I imagine he arrived at that meeting over the cover of night with questions like, hey, how are you doing these things? Are you the promised Messiah? Are you going to expel Rome and usher in a new kingdom of God where Israel would rise again to prominence? But here's what Nicodemus got at their meeting. He got more confused. The conversation, I'll kind of summarize it, kind of went like this. Jesus, you are obviously a teacher from God and nobody could do the works that you do without God. And Jesus responds to that declaration with his own. He says, only people who are born again, or more literally born from above, can see the kingdom. Nicodemus is like, what? He takes it literally. How can somebody re-enter their womb? My mom's dead. I, I'm an old man. So he's still in the dark. So Jesus tries to attempt to bring a little bit more light to his confusion. He tells him how. He says that to enter the kingdom of God, people must be born of water and the spirit. And he goes on to describe with an illustration of how the wind works. 
where it starts, you, you feel its effects, you don't know where it goes, that's kind of like the kingdom. No luck. Nicodemus is profoundly dumbfounded. He said, how can this be? Now, seemingly annoyed, that's the way I listen to it anyway, Jesus fusses at him a bit for being a religious leader with limited understanding. Nicodemus is still in the dark. So Jesus kind of refers back to something he thinks Nicodemus might understand. Two Old Testament stories, Daniel and Numbers. And these two, I think, unlock this passage for us a little bit more. He uses these familiar stories to illustrate who he is, Jesus is, what he must do, and how people can be born from above or saved. So, Jesus first points to an apocalyptic prophecy to say who he is. It's found in Daniel 7, and it says that the Son of Man will come out of heaven, and he'll be a king for all people in whose dominion would be everlasting. And this is the verse that's right before what we read today. It's verse 13. Here's what it says. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven the Son of Man. Jesus is insinuating that he's that guy, the Son of Man, who will be king and usher in an everlasting kingdom. But he even goes a bit further to say what the Son of Man must do. And that's where we pick up in our reading today in verses 14 and 15. And these verses really refer to Numbers 21. And it's the key to understanding what Jesus was put on earth to do and what he was claiming and how we can be born from above. To illustrate the point, I've invited a very special friend to join us. And it's my hope that it will bring to life an illustration for your and my deeper understanding of what it means to be born above. This is Mr. Cuddles. Are any of you freaked out right now? You might be. Hear verses 14 and 15. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted So whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see, the Israelites are traveling in the desert near the Red Sea, and they're impatient, they're hungry and thirsty, and they're afraid of dying. And they're wondering if the bonds of slavery in Egypt might actually be better than their current reality. So they speak boldly against God and Moses, which didn't turn out too well for them. Because apparently God sent some poisonous serpents, I'm grateful this one isn't poisonous, as a divine judgment, which bit and killed many of them. And they came back to Moses confessing their actions, and they asked him to pray on their behalf for the serpents to be removed. So God instructs Moses, and in verses 8 and 9 in Numbers, to say, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze. He put it up on this pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, an Israelite, when the person looked at it, that serpent of bronze, they would live. So here's kind of something weird, right? Like God didn't take away the serpents. For the Israelites to be healed of the snake venom and saved from certain death, They simply had to look at the symbol of death and believe that God would heal them. Now, they had indisputable evidence that they needed healing. You see, friends, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is that he, the Son of Man, would eventually also be lifted up for all the world to see. And by so doing, God would take the venom of the world and our lives that leads to death, and all all of that, and transform it. And for Nicodemus, these claims were not overwhelming, but they were also just preposterous. What he believed about God, the King, the Son of Man, and God's kingdom was flipped 
literally upside down. The son of man who comes from God is going to be lifted up like a serpent in the desert. The kingdom of God built and ushered in, not through violence or the threat of violence, but God demonstrating powerless love. And people would get to enter the kingdom by being born of water and the spirit, healed and saved only by looking at an instrument of death lifted up, not because they followed these laws perfectly. You know, I can remember myself being in a similar spot to Nicodemus. I was assured that there was a God. I was raised in the church, but I wasn't sure about this Jesus. And I certainly wasn't sure about all you Christian people. I was exploring. I was very skeptical about religion. I wondered if just every path led, led to God. Not that there wasn't truth in other religions, but I had a lot of hurt and brokenness too in my own life. And, and Jesus' teachings and some people in the faith were like, drawing me towards him. They weren't hitting me over the hell with this, you're going to hell card. And they seemed to genuinely care about and were actually serving the poor. So I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, hey God, I believe you exist, but I don't know about this Jesus and I certainly don't understand the church. If Jesus is the way and the church is to the way to live out my faith, you're going to have to show me by hitting me over the head with a two by four because I am skeptical and dull. Now, some of you might affirm that that's still the case, but this wasn't when I experienced being born again, but it was when I met God in the dark, just like Nicodemus. There was something about Jesus. There was something about God. There was something about his teachings that were drawing me towards him, but I just wasn't sure. You know, you and I need healing because we too are infected. We don't experience the urgency that the Israelites experienced in the desert because our infection disguises itself. We aren't sure that we need to be reborn or that we need God or we need saving because we have this somewhat illusion of self-sufficiency. And we certainly don't expect death, most of us, anytime soon. We don't see how venom is killing us or the world, or maybe that's too strong of language, the, the way that venom is preventing us from being all who God has called us to be. The word for that infection that the, the Bible talks about is sin, about broken relationship. You know, by the nature of being born, we're broken. Not bad, broken. You and I need healing because we are all infected. Now, we don't experience the urgency that the Israelites had because our, dif our infection kind of disguises itself a bit. We aren't sure that we really need to be reborn, right? We don't need God to save us because the illusion of self-sufficiency is strong. And we don't expect, or we don't act like we're gonna ever die. We don't see how the venom is preventing us from being all who God has called us to be or is killing us in the world. The word for that infection that you know, we hear so long it has heavy meaning is sin. By the nature of being born, we're all broken. There's evidence around us in the systems of the world. All we have to do is drive downtown. We don't need to look too far to see suffering or hate or oppression or evil, or destruction. Many of people close to you, or maybe even you yourself, have your own hurts or hangups or addictions that are preventing you. Mr. Mr. Cuddles, moving all around. See, what sin does is, is it makes us realize that there are some things in our lives that we just can't fix and they result in the splintering or fracturing of our relationships with others and ourselves. And if we're truthful and we embark on kind of an honest appraisal of our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions, we'll discover that there's probably a little infection in there. 
To be born from above or born again is simple but not easy. Jesus says, believe. That's the vehicle of transformation. And I find that people wrestle with that belief. And if that's you, know that you can do that at this church. You can ask hard questions. You can doubt. You can say, I don't know about that. And if any of it makes you feel better, if this makes you feel better, you know, Jesus' closest followers did too. Yet I also need to say that our culture often reduces being bored again down to saying this prayer and hoping it provides the needed fire insurance after you die so we can go on living our lives without any heart transformation or life transformation or participating in the kingdom of God here and now like it is in heaven, right? Like, I don't think that really captures being saved. Being born from above is experiencing being saved from something and being saved for something, here and now and later. Salvation found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is more about a cultivating relationship with a living God that's available to everyone right now, and we often find it in our brokenness, not our strength. And I wanna offer you just a few ways to engage the journey, whether you have believed since you're a little kid, you're a new follower, or someone who once believed but doesn't anymore, or you just have never believed all of this. First, recognize. And I know you're at home, but say this with me, recognize. I want you to notice the ways that God's love revealed in Jesus is being made real in the world. Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. You don't have to look very far even here at this church. Stay after the 9.30 service, go to open arms, come down to the portico, participate in the breakfast, talk to one of the portico cafe employees whose lives have been changed, or guys who live in the portico housing solutions. You'll find Jesus Christ at work. Secondly, gaze upon the serpent. Say this with me, gaze upon the serpent. Examine your own life and take an honest appraisal of the places where there's brokenness, sin, healing, shadow, whatever you want to call it, and your own need for God's healing. And lastly, believe. Be assured that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on a cross heals you and heals the world. Not for being a good person or anything else we do. It's this new spirit that God not only gives us, but activates within us. Ask God to be the author of your life. Ask God to forgive you for the weight of your and the world's sin. Because it's not just all about individual transformation. It's about participating in God's transformation of the world. And we do that together with new hearts, and new spirits, and new actions. Indeed, John 3.16 says this, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, as we recognize, gaze, and believe, we experience the power of grace, the Holy Spirit, which enables us to participate in God's transformation of the world as we prepare for later. Do these things and you will enter the kingdom of God and you will be born again. Thank you so much for joining us today and I really hoped you enjoyed today's message and got something meaningful from it. Now, if you wanna go deeper, there's gonna be reflection questions in the notes below. And if you're curious about what we do at Hyde Park, go ahead and visit hydeparkumc.org forward slash next steps to discover more about us, what we do, and maybe even begin your faith journey with us. I'm Sam and I'll see you next time.